checking in with Mike Williams from the LA Chargers, and you're tuning in to Chargers Unleashed. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jay Captain Radio Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, is being brought to you by Bet Online, Aura Athletic Greens, Mint Mobile, and Rock Spalls. Rock solid sports member of yeah. If this is your first time tuning into the show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Dan Wolkenstein. Officially, training camp is one week in the books. And couldn't think of a better way to do a one week recap, if you will. I don't say this, well, I, I say it a lot. I haven't mentioned it lately to tease this episode, but once again, Dan Wolgenstein working the phones, and when that takes place, good things tend to happen. So we have a very special guest for you today, and Dan Wolgenstein, if you would, please let everybody know of the details. Yes, a one Daniel Popper, who arguably, and I don't even think it's a question, has the finger to the pulse of this Chargers team more so than any other beat reporter out there right now. Man's on fire, if you will. Shout out Denzel Washington. Um, a one Daniel Popper is going to be joining us to talk about all things training camp without pads with pads. Let's talk about Kellen Moore. We're going to talk about this offense with Justin Herbert camp battles galore. We'll talk about the physicality ramping up, talk about a lot of things here. Uh, very exciting episode. It's been a long time coming. Uh, excited to have Daniel Popper from the athletic join us on Chargers Unleashed next. If you've ever thought, why in the world is my wireless bill so damn high? Then let me tell you about our friends over at Mint Mobile who we're partnering with for today's video. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for as low as $15 a month, and you don't have to sacrifice any coverage, speed, or data. They're built on the nation's largest 5G network, so they keep costs low by selling directly to you online. They cut out the retail stores and the salespeople. All Mint Mobile plans include unlimited nationwide talk and text, plus lightning fast 5G and free mobile hotspot. So why should you have to pay for more than you have to to access the same network. It only takes 15 minutes to switch and you'll be paying as low as $15 a month for your phone plan. It really is that simple. So use the link in the description below, trymintmobile.com backslash chargers unleashed to get started. Click the link in the description below or scan the QR code. Senior writer for The Athletic covering your Los Angeles Chargers, lover of tacos and house music, joins us on Chargers Unleashed today. Daniel Popper from The Athletic. How are you, my friend? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, guys. Absolutely. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Long time coming. Long overdue. Uh, exciting times today and this whole training camp here for Chargers fans. Uh, lots to talk about. We'll talk about Derek Ansley and Kellen Moore. We'll talk about camp battles, some surprise standouts, maybe some you know too early predictions. Uh, physicality now up going. Uh, you're big into house music. Training camp so far for this team has been a vibe, both to the fans and the team. Lots of energy. Day two for the Chargers in pads started and finished today. Uh, Herbert seemed to be slinging it all around in red zone. We saw an interception today, receiver making highlight reels. Uh, what are some of your kind of main takeaways from day two of padded practice? Yeah. Um, so they had a, a live period. It was They did like a little bit of a live period in red zone on Monday, but today was like the first real like unscripted period. Um, of camp so far so all three quarterbacks uh herbert stick and duggan each got a drive and so like you know they're not tackling but you're basically spotting the ball you know where the ball carriers first contacted and you're playing out the downs and um so that was really interesting to watch because you really get to see sort of the offenses operate you know one big takeaway is you know they're really pushing the tempo offensively um which is something obviously kellen moore has talked about a lot it's a staple of his offensive philosophy is you know, not necessarily going fast all the time, but using it in specific situations and being really good and really polished when you do use it. Um, I think we saw that sort of, you know, definitely affect the defense, especially early on in that drive. Um, and Herbert was able to move the team down the field, but the defense really buckled down in the red zone. Um, Asante had some really nice coverage on Josh Palmer on a slant route in the end zone. And then um, Khalil Mack had his best rush of camp so far from what I've seen um, and really dominated Rashawn Slater. I've, I don't see Rashawn, um, you know, get, get beat like that on a play, but he came with a bull rush. Rashawn got off balance, was able to anchor a little bit, but by that point, you know, Mac was in Herbert's face and Herbert tried to deliver an out route to Donald Parham and Alohi Gilman, who, you know, continues to be, you know, one of the most instinctive players I've ever covered. Um, read it perfectly, jumped in front and secured the interception in the red zone. So it, it was kind of like continuing with the trend of camp. It's like, 
it feels like this heavyweight battle. I, I wrote it on day two and it, it continued today. I mean, it's punch, it's punch here, punch back, you know, punch and counter punch is really what it's been, which is what you want to see. Um, you know, you don't know exactly what it is until they go up against somebody else. Like, is it just too, like, is it two excellent units having that kind of competition or is it something different than that? You don't really know until you go up against um, somebody else, but that was a really uh, interesting, interesting part of practice. And then they really um, hammered in on third downs today one of those kind of big padded practices where are really getting into, you know, some of these more, um, you know, important and, um, you know, high energy type situations. Um, and so, you know, the offense really dominated the seven on seven period. And then the defense came back and the pass rush really came alive in the third down 11 on 11. Morgan Fox got through with a fe- with a sack. Um, they brought a blitz on, on another third down that, that got home. Um, and then, uh, on the third, third down, um, you know, pressure got home again. Herbert tried to escape. It looked like he might have had an avenue up the middle, but Eric Kendricks, super disciplined, and was there to sort of clean it up. So again, right? Like it seems like whenever one unit sort of steps ahead and 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 delivers that that um, you know right hook or left hook, you know, the other unit really really answers, and that's that's what you want to see in training camp in terms of that competition level. Day two uh, press conference. You were in the press pool. Obviously, you're there every day. But uh, we heard quite a few mentions of like chippiness and physicality and intensity and passion and uh, professionalism and stuff. Kind of talked about from you and from a lot of the press pool and from Coach Derek Ansley and Sebastian just today. You were out there today. Like, talk to us about like the chippiness on display today. Like, who was involved? Like, what do you make of it? Like, where did that whole thing kind of originate? Yeah. So, it was Gerald Everett and Kenneth Murray got into a little bit of a scrap. Um, it was after like a kind of like a swing route completion to, to Keenan. And then all of a sudden I look back to the middle and, and Kenneth is on top of Gerald Everett. They're going at it a little bit on the ground. They got separated by the coaching staff and teammates. I mean, like, listen, I, I think this is my eighth tra- training camp. Like this stuff happens. Like you've got, you know, you know, these, these guys from coaches to players are like compulsively competitive, like the most competitive people on the planet. And so when you're going, um, you know, toe to toe for, you know, day after day in the heat. And now in LA, for whatever reason, the humidity in, in Orange County, um, you're going to end up with something like this. So like nothing uh, really noteworthy about it. Um, other than, you know, some of the defensive guys were, were pretty pumped up about Kenneth sort of answering that call. Um, you know, nothing, nothing that, you know, you look at and you say, oh, this is an issue. Um, they had like kind of a longer uh, post-practice huddle. Obviously, I'm not included in those, but I think it's kind of noteworthy that 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 huddle at the end of practice with Coach Daly in the middle went went a little bit longer um, than usual. But you know, I, you know, it's it's you, what you don't want is um, you know these type of melee things where guys are swinging helmets and you're risking potential injury. But if a couple guys were going at it, play after play after play, and there's a little bit of trash talk back and forth, they get into a little bit of a scuffle and it gets separated. Like that just shows that those guys care, and that's. That's what Derek Ansley said. You know, you want to keep it professional, but you're trying to toe that line between, you know, having that type of high energy and not taking it a little bit too far. And and same thing with Sebastian Joseph Day. It's exactly what he said. Like you're you're it's inevitable. You're gonna get some chippiness. So um nothing to be concerned about. Uh, but that's those are, those are the details of, of what happened today. Dan, you wrote a you wrote a great piece at the beginning of training camp about the relationship between Brandon Staley and Kellen Moore and stretching back all the way to their joint practice last year in training camp. And we've already seen some of those early indicators that you had pointed out in terms of their goals that they wanted to have for this year in terms of aggressiveness, going downfield, creating mismatches. But now from this being Brandon Staley's third training camp, what have you seen differently from him now that he's been operating practice during this first week? Um, and obviously, again, like the the, the points that you were making in terms of what needed to change in this offense has obviously been out there early and often, but is there, is there something different in terms of how Staley has been operating practice that you've seen over this past week? Uh, nothing super noteworthy, like, like some, like maybe subtle structural changes, like, you know, doing a special teams drill and maybe more thorough walkthroughs before they get into the activation period, like very minor stuff that like, for a guy like Brandon Staley, he could probably talk to you for two hours about why he made those structural changes. But for the, the layman fan, probably not going to make a huge difference. I, I think like, you know, one thing that Brandon told me while reporting out that story was that, you know, he just feels more energized w- with Kellen Moore there. And I think you, you sort of see it like you feel it in terms of how the offense is playing. You know, there was um, a certain like stale level to like a lot of the stuff that, you know, happened in Joe Lombardi's offense. And I think like any fan, you know, listening or watching this podcast probably felt that frustration at some point. And that's just sort of a function of, 
of the system that he was implementing. It's a lot of, of um, um, condensed formations, a lot of stuff operating in the middle of the field. Um, and what you're seeing in the Kellen Moore offense is not only more um, opportunities to take shots structurally, but I think when coaching Justin Herbert, you know, putting that emphasis on like, hey, take shots, like, like take shots because more times than not with your talent and the talent around you, it's going to end up in, in a really positive result for us. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times under Joe Lombardi, like he maybe was reticent to call those shots because he didn't necessarily see the value in, um, you know, forcing the ball downfield and, and ending up in, a, in, a, in an incompletion or something like that. He was he was always geared a lot more towards efficiency, whereas Kellen Moore sees Justin Herbert and I think like philosophically believes in, you know, the value of taking some of those shots, even if they don't work out, even if it ends up in an interception. Right. But like creating that space for yourself offensively, because that possibility is always on the table. And you see it like in practice when you're when when Justin is just unleashing these bombs, play after play after play, like how much that lifts up the energy of the entire practice, because I think, you know, as a reporter, you know, I'm sure fans see it when you watch Justin Herbert play, like there's a wow factor to it. And that's certainly like it is not lost on, on some of these defensive players when they see him see him make throws. So I think like that that energy factor, I think, is sort of emanating around everywhere when you see sort of what the offense is doing from from a structural and a philosophical perspective. And, and real quick, I guess the a lot of people see it as maybe like Justin Herbert being pushed out of his comfort zone. Like, do you think, is that the case? Like, does he not, do you think he's out of his comfort zone doing that? Or is he like, all right, finally I can breathe. I can just like let it go. No, I don't think it's outside of his comfort zone. I think it's just like, what, what is your emphasis going to be as an offensive coach and play caller? And like, whatever you're emphasizing, whatever you tell Justin Herbert is like the right way to go about running an offense, he's going to do it because he's capable of doing anything. And he has that type of football IQ and he is that type of perfectionist. And so like, it's just about changing the emphasis. So you're changing the structure of the offense, you're calling more shots, but then you're just changing what you're emphasizing to the quarterback in the quarterback room when you're drilling this stuff, when you're meeting, right? Like, hey, we are going to be aggressive. We are going to take shots. That's going to be the DNA of our offense. And so if that's the emphasis that you're giving to Justin Herbert, like, hell yeah, he's going to go out there and do it. And I think that's really the difference. He's not out of his comfort zone. It's just sort of changing that emphasis of how you're coaching it. And then also building that structure around him so that like, you know, instead of having the check down every single time be Austin Eckler over the middle, like, Hey, if you want to like, if nothing's open, like heave it up downfield to Keenan Allen or to Mike Williams, or even to Josh Palmer or to Quentin Johnson, let those guys go make a play. Like that is a, a viable way, you know, if the play doesn't unfold necessarily how we want it to unfold. So I think it's sort of all those things. Kellen Moore added to this offensive staff and obviously the chargers had a lot of changes to their defensive coaching staff in the offense on the off season. And Based off of what Derek Ansley has talked about in his message going all the way back to OTAs, you know, him talking about basically being he can he can change his tune to any type of player. You know, he's definitely a player's coach, but he can be aggressive with some people, he, people he could be calm with others. Just in terms of what you've seen with how the defense has been running and and as you alluded to, as far as a heavyweight fight goes, because in previous years it would seem Offense would win day one, defense would win day two, and now it seems a little bit more balanced and guys responding, especially on the defensive side of the ball. So what is, what's Derek Ansley outside of the messages that he's put out there to the public, but how is everything kind of coming together and, and what's maybe the biggest difference between how you see how Derek Ansley is operating it now as opposed to what Ronaldo Hill was operating with last year? Yeah, I mean, defensively is a little bit different because the defense is Brandon's. Like Brandon Staley is calling the defense, and so you're, like there's not much of there's not like a schematic shift right going on. Um, I think you know Brandon Staley is going to be involved in all facets of the team. So while he spends a lot of his time you know with the defense you know in practice, he's also you know watching the quarterbacks and he's worried about offense and he's also was a special teams coach early on in his college career. So he's heavily involved in the in the kicking game, right as he calls it. And so I think it was more about finding someone who could um, relay the message and coach the way that Brandon wants to coach if he's not there. Right. And, you know, Derek Ansley and Brandon Staley go way back. You know, they coached together in Tennessee, um, you know, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever it was. And so they have a, maybe a, a, a longer relationship than, um, a, you know, a, um, than, you know, Ronaldo and, and Brandon, because, you know, they cross paths with the Broncos when Brandon was an assistant coach there. And so I think like um, you're seeing um, maybe a different style of coaching from Derek Ansley and maybe um, a little bit closer to the type of energy that Brandon Staley, you know, would want out of that, 
that particular coach if he's not around. And so like one thing I noticed is that uh, at the beginning of practices, you know, they used to in individual drills sort of separate into position groups and then go through their position stuff. Um, you know, now, you know, the defense is starting out as a full unit doing like bag drills, which is like, you know, traditional fundamental football stuff where you're, you know, doing, you know, shuffles over the bag, but it's like the whole team, the whole unit is doing it together and all the defensive coaches are together and they're all, you know, chirping and yelling and clapping. And like, that's very much what Derek Ansley is about in terms of bringing high energy. And like, you know, this is interesting stuff to note in training camp. How much does it really impact the team? You know, we'll see, but like, I think, um, in terms of the fit of how Derek Ainsley goes about things and maybe the energy level that he brings might be a little bit more, um, you know, on Brandon Staley's level in terms of how he wants the defense coach if he's not there doing it himself. And, and that's sort of the best way that I can explain that. Have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to see your personal information exposed on one of those public listing sites? <gasps> Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. We've been trying to reach you concerning your car's extended warranty. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. And brokers everywhere are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. So let Aura handle that for you. You could try Aura for up to two weeks using this link that we're going to put up here on the screen. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you cannot see. So make sure to check out Aura.com backslash Charters Unleashed to get a 14-day free trial and see if your personal information has been leaked online. We're talking to Daniel Popper, senior writer for The Athletic. Honestly, probably one of the best beat writers across the entire NFL. I mean, you're now seeing Daniel Popper now on, like, Rich Eisen's show. I mean, soon enough, he's going to have his own show. It's got to get ridiculous. Don't let it get to your head, Popper. Don't let it get to your head. Yeah, I appreciate Um, it. I, I want to talk about camp battles because everyone, it seems like on X, as we call it now, are posting, as we call it now, about these wide receiver, cornerback it's battles. It's always going to be Twitter. Hey, thank yes. you. Always. Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, midway through week two, it's been discussed at nauseum, but focusing on wide receiver and cornerback specifically, what do you make of the CB3, wide receiver three battles? Like, realistically, I guess maybe a better way of asking this is, like, how much of a difference do you foresee – fans actually seeing in like real game snap count scenarios when it translates to the regular season, like does CB three wide receiver three, like, does that matter in this offense and defense? Um, so we'll start with cornerback. That is a, a more important, I think like discussion to have because, you know, when you say CB three, like what you're talking about is, is the slot cornerback position, you know, the nickel corner, which is the star position in Staley's verbiage, which is that player that's playing inside and covering the slot receiver. That's the battle that's happening right now. JC Jackson so far has been on track. Um, You know, we'll see if he's ready for week one, but he's been in team drills. I think like, you know, at this point on August 1st, like I would, I would, you know, be surprised if he's not available to start the season, but we'll see. Obviously there's a long way to go and a lot of, you know, different hurdles to overcome, but like hypothetically, right. JC's back for week one. You have Michael Davis on the other side. So that open spot is in nickel and other sub packages where you need that slot defender. And so like heading throughout the spring and even in these early days of camp, it's been Jasir Taylor, who is that star player, um, the, the nickel player in, in specific packages. Cause Derwin also plays there in certain packages and JT Woods comes on. So there's, you know, that's the Staley defense you're going to have a lot of different personnel packages, but you know, the other factor here is Asante Samuel jr. Now, if JC Jackson is healthy and obviously Michael Davis is out there, there's not a spot open on the outside. So if Asante is going to get on the field, um, with those two guys healthy and, and, and available, then it would be at, at slot corner. Um, so the question is sort of how do they go about doing this, right? Do they want, you know, I think Asante, where he needs to improve is, is as a run defender. I think we saw that last year. You know, if you're playing in the middle of the defense as a, as a slot defender, like you need to be able to defend the run. And so, you know, I think Jasir Taylor is a better run defender than Asante Samuel Jr. And that's why maybe he might have a leg up in terms of winning that star job. But, you know, are there certain situations where they bring Asante Samuel Jr. into that slot position in certain passing downs? Do they bring him in in dime packages, which they usually play in maybe, um, you know, third and long in those types of situations? And so that's really the battle that's going on right now. Asante, um, you know, as a player, he's he's a big – he's kind of a boomer bust player, right? Like he makes fantastic plays on the ball. He has a, he has a tremendous instincts and a knack for, for getting the football. Um, he's prone to some mistakes and he has that, you know, area that he has to improve. 
as a run defender. And so like, he's a guy you do want on the field because there's always that possibility that he can make a play on the ball. But the question is, you know, do they go with Jasir Taylor as sort of that full-time guy to sort of build that cohesion? Do they try and build in these different personnel packages to get Asante on the field? Do they go with Asante because of that high upside and go with him as their full-time mm-hmm. star and have Jasir Taylor as sort of that, um, you know, more that rotational fourth corner, you know, depth piece. That's sort of what they're working through right now. I think right now, like if the, if the season was starting tomorrow, I think Jasir Taylor would be that star player um, for the most part in those packages. Um, but, you know, Asante had a pick yesterday, made an, like, like I said earlier in the pod, like he made a really nice play in the red zone in that, in that live period. Um, and so that's really the battle that's shaking out specifically at star. And it's really those two guys right now that are, that are battling out in terms of wide receiver three. Um, I don't necessarily think it's going to be a situation where like one guy, you know, wins the job and like then is all of a sudden going to be the guy in every, you know, all 11 personnel and every three wide receiver package. You know, I think like, um, you know, Josh Palmer's looked fantastic, like through these early days of camp, he looks healthy, his route running sharp, his hands, like he's a good player. I think a lot of people kind of are writing him off because it's, <laughs> they took a receiver in the first round, but he's like a really good player. Very, very useful player. There isn't really a hole in his game. You know, I don't think he's some like elite, elite receiver. But even when he was asked to be the number one receiver last year, like he he performed well. And that was while he was battling through like multiple leg injuries. So like that's a good piece to have. And then you have a developmental piece in Quentin Johnson. It's like how much are they going to use him and where they're going to use Quentin Johnson? Um, that's really the question. I think early on it's going to be in a lot of um, like yak situations. Just get the ball in his hands and let him run, whether that's digs, slants, jet sweeps, that type of thing. And then, you know, what Brandon Staley has said repeatedly is like the beauty of it is that like Quentin Johnson isn't in a position where he has to like be a major mm-hmm. contributor early. Um, and so they can sort of let that develop as it goes. Like they don't need to rush it because they have Josh Palmer. Um, and so I think you're sort of going to see that develop as the season goes along. I think it's a good thing to have four really good receivers that you trust, you know, because you have <laughs> options if somebody gets injured. And you also need a lot of receivers in the, in the way that that the NFL is played nowadays. Like it's a passing league and you need multiple guys that can affect the game. Um, And so, you know, I think, so to sum it all up, cornerback three, when we're talking about slot corner, I think that's more of a competition where somebody will win the job by the end of camp. That's, that's my general feeling on that. And then wide receiver three, I think it's sort of going to be an ongoing thing where you feel like you have two guys that can be that third receiver um, and use them in different situations, depending on sort of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with a particular concept or play call. There's been a lot of early praise from Eric Kendricks yesterday, from Sebastian Joseph day to day in regards to Kenneth Murray. And we all know how big of a season this is for him coming in after the Chargers have drafted him um, and what the expectations are going to be with him and Eric Kendricks side by side to cover that middle part of the field. What have you seen on the field behind the scenes that could indicate that this is going to be the year that he is going to take that next step? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I can't sit here and say that like I'm positive that Kenneth Murray is going to take a big step. Like, I don't know if you can hear Frankie in the background, but he's a little <laughs> I bit. He's he, he, he agrees. He agrees. <laughs> he's got some Kenneth Murray takes, and he just has to get him off. He's like, like let me finish. <laughs> yeah, he's got. He's very <laughs> passionate about the Kenneth Murray debate. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think Eric Kendricks being in that room is going to have a positive impact on Kenneth Murray. How big of an impact? You know, we'll see. But having a guy who's that intelligent, who's that smart, who's seen as much as Eric Hendricks has seen, who's performed at that level, um, that's something that Kenneth Murray hasn't necessarily had in his career. Um, And so because because the Chargers, frankly, haven't had a linebacker as good as as um, as Eric Hendricks, you know, a guy with that kind of pedigree. And so, you know, you see it. I mean, Kenneth is following Eric Hendricks around everywhere. I mean, he's in his pocket, as he should be. Right. But. You know, you don't know how much that kind of influence will actually impact a player until you sort of see it in in game action. Um, now, with that being said, like I don't think you know a guy like Sebastian Joseph Day, for example, like he doesn't really get up to the podium and just say stuff to say stuff, you know. And he wasn't asked a specific question about Kenneth, but he went out of his way, you totally. know, to to say that hey, this guy's this guy's improved. I think that's noteworthy because of who it came from and the context that it came in. Now, at the same time, like you know, a big part of this for Kenneth is like, can you play the run effectively? Can you be in the right position? Can you fit it right? Can you, um, and then can you make plays, right? I think we've seen that. Right, right. And we've seen like certain instances of him playing well. I thought there were spurts last year where he played well, but his biggest issue has always been, you know, at times he just looks lost in the run fit, you know? And so, right, but like you, you can't, 
through two days of pads, you can't be like, oh, he's turned a corner, you know, like because they're not even tackling. And so you can so you can make some early interpretations and say, yeah, like he, he looks good, but like um, you can't really, you know, make any sort of real determination until they get on the field. But, you know, with that run defense stuff, like having a guy like Eric Hendricks, who's going to be in the right place at the right time every single time and also has that type of pedigree and leadership skill and communication skill to like get Kenneth Murray in the right place. I think that was a big part of the calculus of signing him. And, and so we'll see. I mean, it's, it's a big question um, and we'll see, you know, sort of what happens. But they also have the option of like taking Kenneth off the field and playing with some of those, you know, they call it their penny package, you know, some of their five man fronts with two edge rushers, three defensive linemen, and only one linebacker on the field. Um, and then in dime packages, they can take Kenneth off the field. So they have options if it's if it's sort of not working out. And then at the same time, he has a rookie behind him and, and Dayon Henley, you know, who, um, you know, has made some plays early in camp. It's got a long way to go, but, you know, that should certainly put some pressure on Kenneth. And we've known since OTAs and minicamp that obviously Jalen Guyton hasn't gotten a chance to practice. We found out on day one that he was being put on the pup list. And everybody had kind of been talking about during this little bit of hiatus between mini camp and training camp that Pokey Wilson had kind of taken some of those early reps and was trying to take advantage of that situation. Now, one name that we didn't really talk about or expect to hear this early is John Hightower. Now I'm not trying to get ahead of myself here, but the chargers, we don't even know how many receivers they're ultimately going to keep when it comes to the final 53. There has been a lot of talk about the possibility of wide receiver six, but John Hightower is a guy who has been making plays over the last three days of camp. Again, I know it's early, but what's kind of the element outside of obviously the, the speed aspect, which matches up very well with Guyton, but what, what has kind of been the installation of him in this offense? Have you heard anything from, um, you know, players or coaches that has kind of indicated the work that he's been putting in over this last, say, year and a half of being with the team? Yeah, I mean, he's been really impressive. Um you know, he's one of those guys, you know, every year in training camp, there's sort of a guy that, that comes out of nowhere. You know, I, I harken back to like last year with Raheem Lane, you know, like a rookie undrafted free agent. And all of a sudden, like on day three of camp, he was like in with the first team dime defense because Derwin was still holding in with his contract situation. So every year there's a guy that sort of shows up and you're like, oh, interesting thing with John Hightower is like he was a fifth round pick and, um, you know, a known guy, you know, has played in games, like caught balls with the Eagles, like, you know. So he's not like some unknown quantity on drafted free agent guy. Um, you know, the speed, like he's a four, four, three guy. I remember writing about him um, coming out of that 2020 draft because shocker, the chargers needed a speed receiver. Um, I think they ended up going with Joe Reed in that draft, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. But um, you know, so, you know, he has that deep field threat and he's shown it like a, the first day it can't be caught a 40 yard touchdown pass from Justin Herbert. What's really jumped out to me is like his footwork and his hands. Like he has made some really impressive, like acrobatic um, catches along the sideline, toe tap catches, um, and really showed like has shown like very good hands in some of those situations and ability to adjust to the football, um, and and is just making plays all over the place. And so like you get into a conversation about like how they're going to structure this roster. I think ultimately they're going to have to keep six receivers because yeah. um, they drafted Darius Davis to be a returner. From what I've seen so far, like I don't know if he's ready to be an NFL receiver. Um, I don't. I just like he's undersized, and he's. I don't think he has the the physicality yet to like make an impact, um, especially in the slot where he's going to be playing. Um, and so, like he went one on one with Raheem Lane in the wide receiver. Right? Yeah. He did one on ones yesterday, and Raheem Lane just manhandled him, and I, and that's going to be an issue for him in terms of how he's going to be able to affect the game. And so, if one of your if you only keep five receivers, and one of those guys is like a returner, like maybe gadget guy you're pretty thin there. Um, and so that's why I lean towards keeping six. Now, who's it going to be? You know, you would like a, a speed element there, right? Because, you know, between Josh Palmer, Mike Williams, Quentin Johnson, Keenan Allen, there isn't that burner deep field threat. You know, Quentin Johnson can, that can get there. Mike Williams can get there, but they're not like that flat line speed that, you know, puts the fear of God in defenses. I'm not saying that Jalen Guyton has that, but he is a four, three guy and he's shown his ability to get deep. Now, you know, depending on what happens with Jalen Guyton, like if John Hightower can prove himself as that guy, like maybe he is that fifth guy, you know, and the sixth would be Darius Davis. You know, if he continues to perform at this level, he's going to be in the mix there. The other guy I would throw out there is Keelan Doss, who had a really good spring. Um, and, um, you know, he's having a, a decent camp so far. I don't, he hasn't made any any huge plays, um, but, you know, was was working in with that first team throughout the spring and has sort of been that guy through walkthroughs and stuff. Um you know, so far in training camp. Now, you know, you want 
that speed element at that spot. Like, I don't know if that's what they're going to do. It's certainly what I would do. You know, Keelan Doss is not that guy. And so, you know, if you do go with Keelan Doss, then you do kind of have that hole, you know, and we've seen what that, what that can mean for this Chargers offense over the last, you know, forever, whatever, like, you know, (laughs) like it's, you feel it. Like when you don't have that speed, you feel it in terms of how the offense can play. Um, And so, yeah, John Hightower has been, been excellent. Yeah. been excellent. And definitely one of my, my stars at camp so far. We're rounded out with Daniel Popper from the athletic. Now I think probably the last thing, and this has probably been a thorn in the side of chargers, chargers fans, but the Achilles heel has been kind of the run game on both sides of the ball. And we're seeing a huge emphasis so far at camp on both sides, whether it's on offense or defense running or stopping the run. What have you seen from either side of the ball that maybe leads you to believe either side will or has improved their respective sides this season? Um, 97's back on the field. That'll that help. helps. That, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it seems simple, but yeah, having the all pro edge rusher back in is probably going to help things a little bit. Um, yeah, I like, it's still early, right? It's only two days in pads. And so I can't make any sweeping, um, sort of proclamations about this, um, defensively specifically. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see, you know, what Eric Hendricks can provide. You know, I talked about him as a leader communicator. Um, you know, when you have a guy that's seen that much, um, what does that do to everyone else involved, you know, in terms of getting guys in the right position pre-snap, uh, in terms of relaying calls, making sure that everything is really tight in terms of your shifts, in terms of your audibles, all those different things. Like, I think that's going to have an impact. Um, and, and last year, I mean, Last year was different than 2021 in run defense. I know everyone wants to like say that like the run defense is bad. It's bad. It's bad. Bad is the same bad. There were different types of bad. You know, 2021 was like, you know, they were just getting blown off the ball in the interior. Like they just did not have the dudes to like play with physicality on the line of scrimmage. Um, that changed, right? They obviously spent a lot of money, you know, to change that. And so like, and I know they had some injuries, but for the most part, like I thought the interior of their line defensive line was vastly improved the issue was on the perimeter and some of that was losing joey you know in week three who is like an elite run defender and then some of it too was they just like they did not tackle well a corner in particular Sunday samuel jr and like you look everyone likes to throw out you know like you know rushing average right like the, like you know you go through it and they gave up how many 50 plus yard rushes how many 40 plus yard rushes they all came to from the same spot they were all outside runs you know, where you needed a corner to make a play and they couldn't make a play. I mean, you go back to the, the last defensive play of the season where Doug Peterson isolated Asante Samuel Jr. on the outside, not to bring it up, I'm sorry, but like, you know, isolated Asante Samuel Jr. on the outside, Asante Samuel Jr. on the outside and, you know, won the game. And so, um, you know, I think getting Joey back will be a difference. I think Eric Hendricks will be a difference. And then, you know, if Asante Samuel Jr. isn't playing on the outside or isn't playing at all, you know, then you, you – uh, potentially take a liability off the field there and, and potentially have some better tackling at corner between JC Jackson and uh, Michael Davis. So that's like the thought process. We'll see if it comes to fruition offensively. It's going to be a lot more downhill. Like it's going to be North South. It's going to be hand the ball off to this, these running backs and let them go upfield. And then also allowing these offensive linemen to, you know, get off the ball and really attack people downhill. It's going to be uh, really a better fit schematically for, um, Zion Johnson, it's going to be a good fit schematically for what Jamari Salyer can do with his strength. Just get off the ball and go downhill um, and really simplify things in that way. Um, and they're hoping that that schematic change and that that change in sort of identity um, will lead to some better rushing results. And we'll see if it comes to fruition. Daniel Popper, just throwing darts, hitting bullseyes all day long, each day, every week as he covers Chargers training camp. You can find him on the X or Twitter, as we call it here on this podcast. Twitter, at, always Twitter. At, Daniel yeah. Popper. Uh, if you do not subscribe to The Athletic, do so just for Popper's articles because you won't find a better writer for this team that covers them than Popper. Popper, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, last question to get you out of here. You cover this Chargers team. You covered a lot of teams prior to the Chargers. How does covering this team compare to the teams you covered in the past? And you can take that however you want it, whether that's the team, whether that's off the field, whether that's the fan, whatever. Like, how do you compare? Your chart, your Chargers coverage versus the years past. Yeah, I, I like covering the Chargers. Um, I have fun doing it. Um, you know, I, I to use a Staleyism, I mean, like each season is kind of different, especially when you're 
changing coaches and and in my case you know um you know i saw a change in quarterback you know from philip rivers to to justin herbert the one thing i will say is i just love chargers fans you guys are the best you have a special place in my heart and i'll love you all forever oh that sounds like the end to a country music song this is fantastic that was it that was a hell of a sign off daniel well done. <laughs> oh man yeah. i love it daniel seriously thank you so much for coming on man uh for daniel popper jake hefter dan wolkenstein chargers unleashed the football network thank you so much for tuning in we'll talk to you next time on chargers unleashed